Welcome back to our final lesson on Cosmos on Trial. In our last lesson, I talked about the true geological column, the fossil record, and examined evidence to show that dinosaurs and man were on the earth at the same time. There is much more evidence I could give that shows dinosaurs and man existed at the same time. For example, we could examine the magnificent jungle temple of Cambodia produced by the Khmer civilization between the 8th and 14th century. According to Dr. Don Patton, these awesome temples were rediscovered by Portuguese adventurers and Catholic missionaries in the 16th century, and many were restored in the 19th and 20th centuries. Te Prom, one of the most picturesque, was left in its natural state. It recently gained international attention as a setting for the first Laura Croft movie. At the corner, formed by an elaborate front entrance at the front wall is a 10-foot column covered with these decorative circles. Te Prom abounds with stone statues and reliefs. Almost every square inch of the gray sandstone is covered with ornate carvings. Hundreds of decorative stone circles surround familiar animals such as monkeys, deer, water buffalo, and parrots. One of the animals pictured is a stegosaurus which once again shows that these ancient people had seen a dinosaur with their own eyes and carved a picture of it just as they did with these other animals. Dr. Patton has more evidence for it. He writes, in 1945, Waldemar Gesrud, a German immigrant and knowledgeable archeologist discovered clay figurines buried at the front of El Toro Mountain on the outskirts of Acambaro, Guanajuato, Mexico. Eventually, over 33,000 ceramic figurines were found near El Toro, as well as Shivo. Eventually, over 33,000 ceramic figurines were found near El Toro, as well as Shivo Mountain, on the other side of town. Similar artifacts found in the area are identified with the pre-classical Chupacarero culture from 800 B.C. to 200 A.D. The authenticity of Jelisrold's find was challenged because the huge collection included dinosaurs. As you look at some of these images of the clay figures of dinosaurs, be asking yourself the question, how could these people living during that time possibly sculpt realistic representations of dinosaurs? There are hundreds of these little clay figurines of dinosaurs, some of which show man and dinosaur together. We could also consider ancient literature, as Wayne Jackson points out. Ancient literature, the literature of antiquity throughout various nations of the globe has preserved numerous records of huge, terrifying animals that held human beings in all. China, Europe, and the Middle East contain many examples of such. Frequently, they are called dragons, and the stories regarding them are not dissimilar. The World Book Encyclopedia comments, the dragon of legend are much like the great reptiles which inhabit the earth long before man is supposed to have appeared on earth. One of the world's foremost scholars of ancient Sumerian literature was Dr. Samuel Noah Kramer, professor of Assyriology at the University of Pennsylvania. In his fascinating book, History Begins at Sumer, the professor has an entire chapter titled Slaying of the Dragon, the first St. George, which focuses upon the Sumerian dragon tradition. Sumer, the southern region of modern Iraq, is the first sophisticated civilization mm -hmm. known to secular history. In that discussion, Kramer observed that the dragon motif is common to almost all peoples and ages. The father of history, Herodotus, 484 to 425 BC, speaks of serpents in Arabia that could fly. Similarly, 
Josephus, A.D. 37 to 95, the Jewish historian, wrote about some sort of serpent that was able to fly in the air during the days of Moses. He may have been relying on legends he heard or that he had read about in more ancient work. Certain types of dinosaurs are classified as pterosaurs, flying reptiles. Much more evidence could be given that shows man and dinosaur roam the earth together. But let's look at one final source, the Bible. You might be thinking the word dinosaur is nowhere to be found in the Bible, and you would be correct. The reason for this is because the term dinosaur was not coined until 1841. However, I want us to look at two creatures described in the Bible that certainly sound like dinosaurs from the book of Job. First is the behemoth. God is asking Job all kinds of questions he does not know the answers to regarding the animal kingdom. Notice what we read in Job 40 and verse 15. Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus tree in a covet of reeds and marsh. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brook surround him. Indeed, the river may rage, yet it is not disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan gushes into his mouth, though he takes it in his eyes, or one pierced his nose with a snare. The word behemoth means beast, and God has just described a huge animal that was very strong. He ate grass, so he was not a carnivore. Besides being huge, one distinct feature he had was a tail that moved like a cedar. Now keep in mind that the cedars in Palestine were huge trees that grew as tall as 120 feet. So this means that this creature would have had a huge tail indeed. Some have called this creature a hippo, elephant, and even a crocodile, but none of these creatures fit the description given. The hippo and elephant certainly do not have tails that would fit the description because their tails are really small. Now one might say that a crocodile tail might fit the description, but the crocodile is easily ruled out because the beast described is a grass eater and a crocodile is not. While we do not know which dinosaur is being described in our text, several of the dinosaurs that lived during that time would fit the description God has given us in our text. Our second creature is the Leviathan. There is a lot of detail given about this creature in Job chapter 41, and I encourage you to read the entire chapter. There are many scholars who say this creature was a crocodile as well. However, I will show several reasons this cannot be. Job 41 in verse 18, his sneezings flash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lights, sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of the nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals, and a flame goes out of his mouth. Now the last time I checked, a crocodile does not breathe fire. Job 41, 25. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. Job 41, 33, On earth there is nothing like him which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing. No doubt seeing a crocodile would be scary, but who would notice when a crocodile raises himself up with those little short legs that he has? How could a crocodile be described as beholding every high thing? Job 41, verse number 1, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Job 41 verse 26. Though the sword reaches him, it cannot avail, nor does spear, dart, or javelin. He regards iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones become like stubble to him. Darts are regarded as straw. He laughs at the threat of javelins. His underside are like sharp potsherds. All of these verses describe a beast that cannot be tamed or easily killed. Yet Herodotus described how the Egyptians captured the crocodile, tamed it, 
venerated the beast, and even adorned it with jewelry. So there is no way the Leviathan was a crocodile. Yet it does fit the description of a fire-breathing dinosaur of some kind. Not only does the Bible describe these creatures that sound like dinosaurs, I have provided plenty of evidence that shows that man and dinosaur walked the earth at the same time. In the show, Neil admitted that using the various layers of the earth is not a reliable dating method. However, he claimed that radioactive dating is an accurate dating method. And he told the story about how this dating method came about and how hard it was to figure out. He says that we can know how old the earth is by applying the radioactive dating method to the asteroid that hit Arizona 50,000 years ago. Of course, no hard evidence is given for the alleged 50,000 years. Radioactive dating is a technique used to date materials such as rocks or carbon, usually based on a comparison between the observed abundance of a naturally occurring radioactive isotope and its decay products using known decay rates. Radioactive dating is usually used to date igneous rocks. These rocks are formed when hot molten material cools and solidifies. These rocks contain parent elements and daughter elements. Parent elements are radioactive elements that decay over time, producing a new element which is called the daughter element because it came from the parent element. However, when the rocks were formed, it is believed that the heat pushes out all the daughter elements. As I said, over time, the parent element stuck in the rock, they are supposed to decay and then turn into daughter elements. So the greater quantity of daughter elements found within the rock, the greater the age of the rock. The two most common parent elements they use currently in this dating method are uranium and potassium. Uranium's daughter element is lead and potassium's is argon. The major problem with this dating method and many of the other dating methods out there is that it relies on the decay rate always being the same. But I've already shown in this series that Earth's history has not always been the same. Also, when you consider that this dating method has been used on rocks that were formed from recent volcanic activity that was known to be less than 70 years old, yet this dating method showed that these rocks were very old indeed. And so this should be enough to show that these dating methods are not reliable. Answers in Genesis writes this, A rock sample from the newly formed 1986 lava dome from Mount St. Helens was dated using potassium argon dating. The newly formed rock gave ages for the different minerals in it between 0.5 and 2.8 million years. These dates show that significant argon, that is the daughter element, was present when the rock solidified. So assumption number one is false. Mount Nagarahohe is located on the North Island of New Zealand and is one of the country's most active volcanoes. Eleven samples were taken from solidified lava and dated. These rocks are known to have formed from eruptions in 1949, 1954, and 1975. The rock samples were sent to a respected commercial laboratory. The ages of the rocks range from 0.27 to 3.5 million years old. Because these rocks are known to be less than 70 years old, it is apparent that this dating method is not reliable. When radioisotope dating fails to give accurate dates on rocks of known age, why should we trust it for rocks of unknown age? In each case, the ages of the rocks were greatly inflated. While Neil may claim that radioactive dating is completely accurate, I have shown that it is not. There is no reason for us to doubt a young earth. As I've shown in this series, there is an abundance of evidence that points to the earth as being young, just as the Bible proclaims. In the show, we are taught about a lot of different men and women who made various discoveries over the years. Many of these scientists that Neil talks about also believed in God. For example, Sir Isaac Newton discovered the law of gravity, among other things. Yet notice what he said. Gravity explains the motion of the planets, but it cannot explain who sets the planets in motion. The most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets 
could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Sir Isaac Newton had no problem believing in God and in true science. As great as his find was on gravity, did you know that the Bible talks about gravity in Job 26 and verse number 7? He hangs the earth on nothing. As I mentioned in an earlier lesson, people used to think all kinds of strange things about how the earth was held up. But I cannot think of any other explanation from our verse other than it talking about what we call gravity. Sir Isaac Newton also figured out that white light could be divided into seven colors using a prism which can be parted and then recombined. Though this was a great breakthrough for the scientific community, this scientific fact of light being able to be divided was known a long time ago when God asked Job in Job 38 verse 24, by what way is the light parted? It was not until the 17th century that we figured out that light was not instantaneous, but that it travels on a straight path at 186,000 miles per second. Though it took us a long time to figure this out, God's Word told us a long time ago that light traveled on a path as God asked Job in Job 38 verse 19. Where is the way to the dwelling of the light? The word way means road or path. Though the Bible was never intended to be a science book, it never ceases to amaze me about the little details that we find about scientific information that has just been discovered over the last 300 years by man. I've already talked about the complexity of man and animal in a prior lesson, but I want to focus on a creature that Neil brought up twice in the series called a tardigrade or a water bear. This is a small creature less than one millimeter long that is one of the toughest creatures you will find on the earth. You can freeze them, boil them, starve them, and even put them in space, and they can survive. The only reason that Neil brought this creature up was to say that it had survived the alleged five catastrophes that happened over the last 500 million years. However, this little creature is another one that defies evolution due to its complexity and built-in ability to withstand the harshest of environments. Notice what creation.com says about our creature. How do they withstand such environmental extremes? By shutting down their metabolism during the unfavorable conditions. When things become unbearably hot or cold or dry, many tardigrades curl in their head and legs and roll up into a barrel-like shape called a ton. They then make the biochemical preparations for shutting everything down. Even their respiration ceases completely. But later, when favorable circumstances return, the tardigrade uncurls itself, again extending its legs and head, and life goes on as before. The known record durations for survival, in this case without water, is 120 years from tardigrades taken from dried out moss kept in a museum in Italy. The question becomes, how could these creatures survive the harsh environments they were subjected to if they had to slowly evolve the ability to shut their metabolism down? I would suggest that they would have died out a long time ago if they did not have all these things in place that allows them to survive in these harsh environments. Thus, the tardigrade is just another great example of how this creature was created and designed by God and could not have come in existence by evolution. Neil barely talked about the ocean and the water cycle in the show, but I want to take some time to talk about oceanography and the Bible. Oceanography is the study of the history, geography, motions, and chemical composition of the ocean. The ocean is another important creation of God. It covers around 70% of the earth's surface and it is the primary source for our life-giving rain. It has been estimated that if the ocean was half its size, we would only receive a fourth of the rain that we do now, and the planet would virtually become a desert. On the other hand, if the ocean covered a half more of the land than it does right now, we would receive a fourth more rainfall, and much of the land would turn into a massive swamp. But God created it in such a way that it has just the right balance, showing once again that the earth had a designer. Our oceans also help maintain our temperatures across the globe because water heats and cools at a much slower rate. For example, when the weather turns cold, the heat given off from the ocean helps keep things a little bit warmer. 
Also, about 50 to 85% of the oxygen we breathe comes from the plants that live in the ocean. As I mentioned in our second lesson, the moon is in the perfect place to make our tides just right, which gives the proper movement of the plants in the ocean so they can live. Without all these factors being just right, life on Earth would not exist or be very limited depending on how far off these factors are from what they are right now. Even the salt in the sea plays a crucial role to life on Earth, according to Dr. Robert E.D. Clark. He says that water vapor alone does not readily lend itself to the production of clouds. Nuclei, he says, must be provided on which the water can condense. The huge quantities of salt in the seas together with the wind and water action create the conditions whereby the formation of rain is generally made available over the surface of the earth. There are many benefits we get from the ocean. Number one, we get 13% of our salt from it. Number two, it contains many useful minerals that we use such as magnesium, gold, iron, copper, cobalt, and nickel. Number three, it provides a way to travel across the world by boat. Number four, its moisture provides us with life-giving rain. Number five, it sustains life for many different creatures, many of which we can eat. Number six, its tides help clean out our harbors and it keeps things fresh. Number seven, it keeps its plants alive, which provide us with 50 to 85% of our oxygen. Again, if all the things I have said about our ocean doesn't scream intelligent design, it should. For the remainder of our time, we are going to examine some more scientific foreknowledge from the scriptures. The water cycle, Job 36, 27, for he draws up drops of water, which distill as rain from the mist, which the clouds drop down and pour abundantly on man. Indeed, can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds, the thunder from his canopy? These scriptures talk about God drawing up the water and how it falls to the earth from the clouds. This is also declared in Amos 5 in verse number 8. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is His name. One last passage I want to look at that goes along with this is Ecclesiastes 1 in verse number 7. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. All of these passages are making a scientific statement about the cycle of water. All the water on the earth is going through a continuous cycle of rain, drainage, and the river flow which mainly ends up into the sea. Since all this water is running out to sea, what keeps it from overflowing? The answer is evaporation in the hydrological cycle. The water from the sea evaporates and basically turns into the clouds which dump their water, which we call rain, all over the face of the earth and then eventually it drains back out to sea once again. This cycle is repeated over and over again. But how did Solomon, Job, and Amos know this in their day when this concept was not generally understood until the 16th or 17th century? Well, I believe the answer is because God supplied them with this information. The recesses of the deep, as found in Psalm 33, 7, 2 Samuel 22, verse 16, and Jonah 2, in verse number 6. We have several passages in the Bible that speak about the topography of the ocean floor that could not have been known by the early writers of the Bible since they had no way of exploring the depths of the ocean with any precision. The closest thing they could do was to take a sounding, which was done by using a lead weight attached to a rope that they could drop into the water to see how deep it was. We have this mentioned in the New Testament, Acts 27, verse 28. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. A little farther on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. In context, these men thought that they were getting close to the shore, so they took a sounding and found that the water was 20 fathoms. A fathom was measured from the tip of the middle finger to the tip of the other middle finger, which would be right around 6 feet, which means that the first sounding was around 120 feet deep. The next sounding they took was around 90 feet. So using this method, their knowledge of the topography of the ocean floor would be very limited. Yet the Bible gives us some specific details about the ocean floor. 
For example, notice what Psalm 33, 7 says. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Also, God asked Job in Job 38, 16, Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? 2 Samuel 22, 16 refers to the channels of the deep. The word recess means hidden. And the writer of our psalm talks about this deep place as a storehouse. And this is exactly what can be found in all three oceans. In 1873, some British scientists first discovered a recess in the Pacific Ocean that was five and a half miles deep. And then another team found an area that was over six miles deep. It has been estimated that if the Earth's surface was smoothed over, the current volume of water in the ocean would cover the entire Earth two miles in depth. The ocean has a far greater depth than the height of the land. To give you an example, if Mount Everest was placed in the lowest known depression in the ocean, the water would cover the top of Mount Everest by at least a mile. Now the question becomes, how could these early writers have known about these deep storehouses of the ocean? Again, I'm left to the conclusion they could not have known this on their own. The only way they were able to give us this information is because it came from God. A.E. Parr, who served as the director of the American Museum of Natural History, wrote this, Before the invention of echo sounding equipment, it was generally thought that the bottom of the ocean would present the appearance of plains, plateaus, and general rolling terrain. Now we know that it also has valleys and mountain ranges and even canyons to equal all the forms we find on land. Now I cannot possibly know what every single person throughout history thought about the topography of the ocean floor, but without having the ability to explore the depths of the ocean, I could easily see how people back then would have simply thought that the further you went out, the deeper it got. I cannot imagine any of them thinking that the ocean floor had canyons and mountains. Yet notice what the book of Jonah records in Jonah 2 and verse number 5. The water closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed up on me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. This account of Jonah teaches us that there were mountains in the ocean. Yet it wasn't until the 1800s that such things were known for sure. Once again, the Bible shows that it is spot on with modern day science, which is another proof that God provided this information. Even today, we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the ocean floor. Yet the Word of God informed us long ago about some of the details about the ocean floor before man invented a way to confirm it. Now let's look at the path in the sea as found in Psalm 8, verse number 8. One of the greatest finds in the 1800s has to do with oceanography. A man by the name of Matthew Fontaine Mari discovered the sailing paths in the sea. Dioff writes about this in his book. Before Matthew Fontaine Mari lived, there were no sailing lanes and no charts of the sea. One day when he was ill, his son read to him from the 8th Psalm. He read that God put under man the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the pass of the sea. Read that again, he said. Upon hearing it the second time, the venerable scientist said, If the word of God says that there are paths in the sea, they must be there. I will find them. Today, Mr. Mari is known as the father of oceanography. He founded the Annapolis Academy, also in Richmond, Virginia, there's a statue of Mr. Mari with a Bible at his left foot and the chart of the sea in his hand. Once again, we can see that God's Word was right on. Isn't that incredible? Now let's look at the springs in the ocean. Job 33, 16. Have you entered into the springs of the sea? In this chapter, God is giving Job a taste of his infinite wisdom. And in this verse, he speaks of the springs of the sea. The earliest mentioning of these springs in secular history that I could find comes from the writing of a Greek geographer, Strabo, who lived from 63 B.C. to 21 A.D. 
As strange as it may sound, many of these fresh water springs have been found in the different oceans. Once again, we can see the Bible is spot on with science. Now let's talk about the ocean and evolution. One of the strongest arguments against evolution is this. There simply has not been enough time for the process of evolution to occur. Even the followers of Darwin agree, no time equals no evolution. So evolution has to have its millions or billions of years to work. Consider this. It is estimated that more than two billion tons of sediment are dumped from the rivers into the oceans each year. It has been projected that all the Earth's continents will erode away in some 14 million years. One evolutionary source was baffled regarding this and he said the following, Why in the course of a millennia is there so astonishingly little sediment on the ocean floor? What could possibly be the answer to this question? It seems very simple to me. It's because God created the heavens and the earth, so just as the Bible suggests, the earth is very young. Discoveries like these show that the earth is not old enough to support the evolutionist timeline. Again, no time equals no evolution. So much more could be said, but I want to close by briefly looking at the first and second law of thermodynamics. Did you know that Moses taught the first law of thermodynamics in Genesis 2 and verse number 1? Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. The first law of thermodynamics state that neither matter nor energy can be created or destroyed. The word finished in our verse is a verb which is in the past definite tense, which indicates an action completed in the past without a continuing action in the future. In other words, Moses is saying that after God finished with His creation, nothing else is being created because it was finished. And that is exactly what the first law of thermodynamics states. This law is a recent discovery, but God's Word taught us this law a long time ago. The second law of thermodynamics states that matter and energy can be changed in form or level, but it is always toward a lower level. This tells us that the earth and the universe is running down. For example, the sun is burning up and will eventually burn out. We are slowly but surely using up the earth's resources. The earth was never intended to last forever. Hebrews 1 and verse 10 says, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. Everything is on a downward slide and Peter tells us that at the second coming of Christ, the earth will be destroyed. Once again, we see the Bible and science agree with one another. Yet once again, I want to point out that the second law of thermodynamics is a recent discovery. Hope you have found this series helpful and that you will share this with everyone that you know. I still agree with what Neil said when he told us to test everything. And if we do not find it to be true, then we must reject it. My studies have shown me that there is no proof for evolution, but there is an abundance of evidence for God and creation as described in the Bible. But don't just take my word for it. Study the evidence for yourself and draw your own conclusions. Yeah.